So then I think the, um, it's what we need to talk about now is, well, so we know that they should be doing exercise. So what should a physio-led program for HIPOA focus on? And this was a paper, again, published by um, our Norwegian friends where they developed an exercise program for OA of the hip. And the first few slides just have um, some, sorry, we'll come to some slides that have just some pictures from the, um, from the intervention, but I thought it would be good to go through some of the exercises that I commonly use with someone who has hip osteoarthritis. So in this particular program, the patients did the program for three months. So three months seems to be a good you know, length of time. And they were supervised two to three times a week to go through their exercise program. And it targeted their hip strength, which is pretty obvious, I think. But interestingly, it also targeted their knee strength as well and their trunk strength and functional strength, and it did address flexibility. So I think the th area where the hip's a little bit different to the knee is that um, flexibility is a really, really important mm. part because they do lose that range of motion in the hip, I think, more than they do in the knee, yeah. particularly in those functional movements. Yeah. Um, so I think looking at flexibility is is important in the hip. And did when you do, do you target hip strength, mm. do they, they measure the benefits of hip strength? Do they actually get stronger? In this particular study, oh, yeah, in this study, yes, but they they did, um, yeah. So broadly. yeah, more broadly, <coughs> when you do target strength, most people do get stronger now, over three months, for example, yep. as you said. Yep. Yeah, yeah, um, and they also let them progress when their pain was three out of ten or less. So they didn't expect to be pain free with their exercises, and I think that's important when people with arthritis are exercising that it will they will have some pain. It just needs to be a mild, acceptable level of pain for them. Yeah, and so three is that sort three? Of is, yeah, it's sort of a magic. Th some studies say five out of ten. This particular study was three out of ten. Yep. But I think it's just as long as the pain's acceptable to the patient. Yep. Like I say, it's not too bad, and it settles usually by the next day. Yep. So you also use the next day when they wake up. Yeah. If they haven't flared a exactly. lot, then what you've done the day before is probably okay. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we'll just go through some of the typical exercises that we'll get somebody to do. <coughs> so I really like hip abduction and adduction exercises with a band. And we can see here the abduction and then the adduction exercises. It's really, it's a nice simple exercise, a band around the ankle um, or tied off to a table or something like that. Um, it's important when patients are doing these band exercises that they have something to hold on to for balance because you tend, you want to go quite heavy with your resistance and if they haven't got something to hold on to, they tend to wobble around. But that's a really, really simple and effective way of getting improving hip ab and adduction strength. Knee extensions are really, really important one. And you can do that either if they have access to a gym um, on like a knee extension machine at the gym. But you can see in the um, other video that you can also use knee extension quite effectively just with a TheraBand tied around to the table or something behind the patient as well. But quads, quad strength is really, really important with these patients. Hamstring strength is also important and there's lots of different ways that you can do this. So there's the old hamstring curl machine that you can use in the gym, but you can do things like using um, a roller to get hamstring strength and you can add in some bridging at the same time to sort of engage the glutes and the trunk as well. And then you can also um, use a slider so that's a really nice way to get some hamstring strength and again, adding in some, some glute and some trunk strength at the same time. So don't forget the knee muscles, the quads and the hamstrings as well as the hip muscles when we're seeing someone with hip arthritis. This is where we get to our functional exercises and this is, um, it's a bit like the sit to stand test that we talked about before, but we can use that as a therapeutic exercise as well. It's a great way um, of getting all over lower limb strength through the sit to stand test and it's really functional mm -hmm. to these patients a bit like people with knee OA as you would know Adam they lose that ability to sit to sit to stand with confidence so sit to stand is a really really nice functional exercise to do as well as our step ups so stepping up and down again it's a really simple functional exercise you can step up and down um, in front of the step and behind the step but you can also do side on stepping up and down as well to incorporate more of the lateral hip muscles at the same time. And again, you can vary the height of the step. You can vary the speed of the step up. Another thing that I often do with patients who are doing step ups is I get them to lift their arms up and down as they're doing the step up as well, because as soon as you lift the arms above the head, that engages the trunk. So adding arm lifts in to functional exercises like the step ups or like the sit to stand that we just look, looked at before can be a really, really nice way of um, bringing in some trunk strength as well. 
Um, lunges are a great exercise. So whether it's a reverse lunge that we can see here or a forward lunge is really, really important as a functional exercise. And that's because it obviously is encouraging strength, but functionally it's a really, really important um, move to be able to do. Particularly if we think about our younger people who have hip osteoarthritis, it's a bit like your um, post-ACL groups who have knee OA, that they're often young people, you know, these people with hip dysplasia or hip impingement, where they need to be able to do that movement functionally, but they also like to be able to do it in gym classes and things like that. So being able to do a lunge is really Obviously important. this example here looks like it's quite a, a large lunge where they're going into quite a yeah. degree of hip flexion, say in your older mm. adult who may be less you know, mobile, mm. who has hip osteoarthritis, you're just doing a smaller version of that or you're, how you modify so you can modify. Yeah, so you can, yeah, it's a really good point how you can modify it or regress it. So you can um, get them to hold onto a stick while they're doing it. That is a, will already take it back to a slightly less intense level. Shortening the length of the lunge and also reducing the depth of the lunge can be really, really mm -hmm. helpful. And then using something like a slider where you have a slider under the foot and you might be sliding the foot forwards and backwards going through a lunge type movement, but not actually lunging can often be a really nice first step to okay. then progressing into lunges. So with a slider, holding onto a stick and sliding backwards yeah. and forwards. And with a lot of these strengths, particularly back to the impairment of specific strength exercises, are you in the knee, there's obviously a big debate around closed kinetic chain exercises and open kinetic chain exercises. Do, is, is that something you think about in the hip, like you're getting those open chain abduction, adduction, but also maybe the closed chain with the bridges. Do you find that mm. they address different things or you mm. use them differently to I target? I think so. Yeah, I think, I think it's good to do both. Okay. I think you do, you do get def different benefits. And even those band exercises are a really nice example where you're getting open chain on one leg and closed chain on the other. True. So with the band exercises, I will always get somebody um, with a hip condition to do both legs. So even if they've only got pain on one yeah. side, because they're getting that closed chain benefit by doing it um, as the standing leg yeah. and getting the open chain benefit <coughs> by doing it as the band leg. So I think engaging both sides is really important mm -hmm. with all of these, with all of these hip exercises, mm -hmm. I'll always um, do them on both. If they're one-legged exercise, do it on both legs mm -hmm. because you, partly because we see strength deficits bilaterally, but also because you do get an, a different effect when it's a support leg versus the moving leg, for example. Yeah. And so if I, Take it back a step and say there might be two people and one has osteoarthritis mm. and or and, and weakness mm. and pain the other one has osteoarthritis but is strong mm. and um you know has pain mm. so how do we know that it's the the strength that will we need to address a bit like the imaging like a lot mm. of people have labral tears but don't have pain so we're not addressing that because it's not correlated with yeah. the pain necessarily so someone might be really weak mm. but not have pain mm. someone might be really weak and have pain and we think well we need to get you stronger to overcome your pain, but their their brother has is weak but doesn't have pain. Mm. I'm not sure what my question is, but yeah, you, I think I see where you're going, and yeah. I think um, I think the answer to that is I know you've done some work, Adam, yourself, where you've found that being weak in quadriceps muscles is a risk factor for developing knee osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I'm right in yep, saying that. You're right. Yep. So we don't know. No one's looked at that in the hip. Yeah. So we don't know whether. Um, having weakness and not having pain makes you more likely to get pain down the track. Yeah. So it could be, I suspect that weakness could be a risk factor for progressing to yeah. pain, a bit like having a labral tear is a risk yeah. factor for developing pain. Yeah. But to my knowledge, there hasn't been any studies in the hip that's actually shown whether that's the case yeah. or not. Yeah. I'm just trying to get my head around the whole yeah, impairment and how that drives the mechanism yeah. of pain and then the, the treatment response. But there's so many that. social and psychological yeah. factors as well that influence pain in the hip in the same way that they do yeah. in other, like in low back pain and shoulder yeah. pain and knee pain. Yeah. So you can't, um, you can't, hmm. you can't completely yeah, disentangle <clears throat> all of them. And I think that that improvement in strength and its relationship to confidence, self-efficacy, um, is in, is very is key is yeah. a key part of it. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, we, yeah. So we, the mechan the mechanistic side we don't fully understand mm. yet. It's very difficult to disentangle. Mm. It is, yeah.